Firstly, I'd like to uh, thank uh, Nefkir for inviting me to speak. And over the next uh, 45 minutes or so, um, the title of my talk, as you see here, is the Protocytopathies, Definitions, and New Directions. And so we'll kind of walk through uh, minimal changes in FSGS, which we globally refer to as the Protocytopathies, and um, talk about definitions as well as um, what's next on the horizon. <clears throat> So I'll start with um, like to just convey my disclosures. Uh, as you see, they're consulting honorary from the following and a research support from those companies there. So as I said, over the next 45 minutes or so, we'll, we'll go through the following. You know, the first thing we're gonna start with is just definitions. Definitions of the product syndrome, minimal changes in FSGS. And as we do that, um, we'll come clear is the limitations in those current definitions. After that, we'll move a little bit more into the um, uh, more recent discoveries, illustrating the potential novel diagnostics tools to define the overlapping and distinctive natures of mineral changes in FSGS. Uh, we'll outline the, the current therapeutic strategies for mineral change in FSGS, mostly based on uh, the KDGO guidelines of 2021. And lastly, we'll introduce some novel therapies currently being evaluated for mineral change in FSGS. I understand or I suspect that um, people in the audience are, you know, a variety of backgrounds, but many of you are quite well experienced from a personal level or caring for someone on a personal level uh, with these conditions. And so uh, I'd like to go through not only the basics, but really kind of dive into some of the more deep science. Um, that being said, if there's things that I can help clarify or that I should, um, uh, you know, go in more detail, I would welcome your questions and requests because really, the idea is, of course, for you to get whatever you can out of this. So we'll start with the basics, the, the nephrotic syndrome. Um, <clears throat> and I highlight the nephrotic syndrome as specifically as a uh, distinction from nephrotic range proteinuria. The nephrotic syndrome as defined is um, heavy proteinuria. Um, so defined as greater than three and a half grams per day. But not only the heavy proteinuria, um, but also other systemic manifestations, specifically low albumin in the blood. Um, and we know that that is not just based on the amount of protein loss. It really does reflect the underlying inflammation um, and other um, characteristics of these conditions, um, and which make, again, distinctive from just having proteinuria alone. As a result of the heavy proteinuria, as well as the low serum albumin, um, you we see fluid retention. That's the primary uh, way that people present, primary manifestation. Um, and you know, we've heard this as edema or anasarca when it's total body fluid. Um, <clears throat> the other thing we see is all the complications of the protein loss. And you know, we think about protein loss causing low albumin, as I mentioned, and fluid retention. But we know that other proteins are also lost, uh, particularly cholesterol binding protein, vitamin D binding protein, uh, thyroid binding protein. So the body reacts in, in a variety of ways. One is to actually generate more cholesterol. And so we do see that cholesterol is markedly elevated out of proportion to what you'd otherwise expect for diet or other, um, other conditions. Um, and it's, it's really due to the heavy proteinuria. <clears throat> we can also see, again, as I mentioned, loss of vitamin D binding protein. So really specific, uh, uh, fairly, sorry, it's fairly significant vitamin D uh, deficiency. Um, and I, as I said, this is in comparison to when we see nephrotic range proteinuria uh, alone, which is really defined as just the protein loss. And that distinction does help us in terms of trying to separate out these conditions in terms of mineral change, FSGS, primary, secondary FSGS, et cetera. In terms of the clinical presentation, again, many of you know this all too well. Um, from a, a laboratory standpoint, we see again the protein in the urine, but of course, most people don't present to us telling us they have protein in the urine. They may notice a foamy appearance of the urine, but really the most prominent symptom people experience is uh, fluid retention or edema. And, um, uh, you know, that, as again, many of you have unfortunately experienced, that can be first attributed to many different things, including just you know, venous stasis or heart problems or even allergies when it presents with facial edema. And it's only when someone actually looks at the kidney more strictly that we see that the, really the issue is um, protein loss and 
and all the complications I mentioned before. In terms of kidney function itself, oftentimes it's, it's preserved. GFR is preserved, creatinine is normal, at least initially. You may see some renal dysfunction, again, depending on which condition uh, we are uh, uh, facing. Oftentimes there is elevated blood pressure and that can result from the fluid retention as well as the um, inflammation in the kidney. And as I mentioned before, the hyperlipidemia. When someone presents with nephrotic syndrome, our approach is really sort of twofold. One is to look for a systemic condition um, that uh, can lead to nephrotic syndrome. Um, things like lupus, chronic infections, um, hematologic disorders, um, but that is also always paired with, at least in adults, um, a kidney biopsy in the renal pathology. Uh, I'm an adult nephrologist, um, and so I don't see children um, who are often diagnosed with nephrotic syndrome without a biopsy, um, for good reason. Um, but really for us, we pair things together, both the, um, these laboratory findings as well as the, the kidney biopsy. Now, again, just to go through definitions and make sure we're all on the same page, um, one interesting um, aspect of the definition of nephrotic syndrome is the idea of defining it based on steroid response. And this has mostly been uh, done in children, but I do think it's actually fairly instructive in terms of really helping see that there are different conditions that are being sort of categorized in the same way. Um, you guys, again, may be familiar with these terms, steroid sensitive nephrotic syndrome, which really refers to someone who has complete remission of nephrotic syndrome after four weeks of standard dose steroids, relapsing nephrotic syndrome uh, or steroid dependent, depending on how many relapses or how much steroid people are on while they relapse, and then steroid resistant nephrotic syndrome, where there's no response at all. And even that can be distinguished further in terms of primary steroid resistance, which is um, you know, where even at the first attempt to use steroids, there's no response, or secondary steroid resistance, which is after people have an initial response to steroids, after a relapse, the steroids are given again and they do not respond. And again, these are likely represent sort of different conditions in terms of primary steroid resistance versus secondary steroid resistance. And again, we're, we're ultimately trying to parse out um, this, to, in some ways, um, really a cluster of conditions we call minimal change in FSGS rather than really two distinct um, conditions that uh, have really a very clear underlying pathophysiology. So in terms of minimal change itself, um, you know, really the, the problem with um, uh, glomerular disease as a whole and our part of our limitation in terms of our, um, uh, what I think is, honestly held, um, held us back in terms of making progress is how we've defined the condition itself. Um, and really all the glomerular diseases are primarily defined and sort of classified based on what we see in pathology, not what we know what causes these conditions, although we're starting to get there, but it's still very far from that. And so it really is, you know, we take a biopsy and we, um, uh, you know, the, the tissue is prepared and, and, and stained to sort of distinguish different tissues. And the pathologists and nephrologists will look at it and they describe what they see. And that is what these sort of disease states have been referred to. And minimal change disease is really referred to because the glomerulus, the kidney filter that's seen there in the image um, is essentially normal. Um, it doesn't look like there's any changes from the norm. Uh, and specifically, there's no glomerular sclerosis, there's no mesangial cell proliferation, which means these sort of dark purple cells that you see there, there's a normal amount of them. The basement membrane, which is sort of the barrier um, that you see sort of around those open white, um, the white circles, those basement membranes are not thickened. And then an additional test, which we, <coughs> excuse me, called immunofluorescence, where antibodies are overlaid on the tissue to see if they tag antibodies deposited anywhere in the kidney, uh, minimal change conventionally has had a negative immunofluorescence. Um, and uh, we'll, we're discovering that may not be entirely true. And we'll talk more about that uh, later. So how do we know there's something wrong? There's something wrong because when we um, go on very high magnification, 
uh, with the electron microscopy, we see these very characteristic findings. And when we're doing this, you're sort of looking at the kidney filter, the glomerulus at an angle. And so what we're seeing is you know, the podocyte, which is sort of this, um, has been depicted as sort of like an octopus-like uh, appearing um, structure, or a, uh, I like to look, think of it as sort of a, like a bungee cord with a lot of different actual hooks on it. <clears throat> but the actual ends of that, the, we call the foot processes of the podocytes, where the podocyte sort of attaches to the glomerular basin membrane, that's what we're kind of looking at in a, almost like a cross section. And you see on the, the top, it's a normal looking glomerulus and podocytes where those podocytes are sort of upright and they really kind of see they're kind of attached to the kidney filter. And the bottom is what we see in mineral change. These are essentially, um, if not all of them in the nephrotic syndromes, we get podocyte foot prostate the things are sort of flattened out. And that's how we know, even though the light microscopy may be normal, that there is, um, that there is uh, you know, certainly a pathology going on. The other thing is the absence of what we call electron dense deposits. And I mentioned before, we're looking for antibodies um, that deposit in the kidney that may sort of cause this in inflammatory response that causes ultimately the kidney injury. Um, in mineral changes, conventionally, there are no electron dense deposits. Um, so this is all kind of puzzled people to think, well, then you know, what is the actual, what's actually causing this injury? And is it antibodies? Is it something else, et cetera? And this image here from a few years ago does try to get a better sort of depiction of what understanding of um, the pathogenesis, you know, how the, the condition develops. On the top, you have those normal podocyte foot processes, um, and you see them attached to the glomerular base of membrane um, with a variety of, uh, of proteins that are, that are important. And uh, above that, you see parts of the immune system, uh, B cells and T cells, which are both, both uh, categories of lymphocytes. B cells are the antibody producing lymphocytes. And we think that there must be a significant role of um, both, if not, um, you know, one or the other, if not both, really, of these types of lymphocytes in, in uh, causing the ultimate injury, because we know that um, rituximab, which is a, uh, a monoclonal antibody directed at B cells, um, can help in this condition, suggesting that if you knock out B cells and knock out antibody production, uh, there is um, uh, improvement in this overall condition. So all this is still clearly, you can see a lot of question marks on that on that uh, picture because we still don't know. We're getting closer and I'll talk about again, the most recent discoveries in a few minutes, but uh, we still are um, a bit of a ways from really uh, understanding it all. Now we'll, we'll move over to, to FSGS and, you know, I sort of, uh, in the quotes a disease by any other name, because once again, FSGS um, has really been, I think, better sort of hammered home. The message has been really, this is a pathologic description, meaning that all it is, is that you have a, um, uh, if you look at the glomerulus or you look at a bunch of glomeruli, um, you, <clears throat> excuse me, a foci of them. So meaning that a third or less of the glomeruli that are sampled in the kidney biopsy have a, we call segmental scar. So basically part of that filter is scar. And that is essentially what FSGS is sort of defined as. What we don't know though is you know, how that scar got there. Um, and the metaphor I use is sort of you're arriving at the scene of the accident. You see the accidents occurred and you see the damage that's occurred, but what you don't know is how it developed. And again, we are recognizing that certainly this has become more common that we recognize it. And as we've recognized it's more common, we also appreciate that there is a much greater degree of heterogeneity in this condition than, than we otherwise had, uh, had known. And so how that scar really develops can be a variety of ways. And as a result, when we think about therapeutic intervention, we really have to think about kind of what you know, caused the injury. And we have not been able to, to really define that as of yet. So without a, um, a specific diagnostic test that we have uh, to separate these out, we have used sort of the clinical presentation um, 
to try to help us guide, you know, what we refer to as disease phenotypes. So which of these sort of, um, uh, what may be causing the injury and does a clinical presentation sort of help differentiate different causes of that? And so three categories that are outlined here, <clears throat> an FSGS sort of behaving like minimal change, where you have this explosive onset of protein loss in the product syndrome. Overall, uh, you may have normal kidney function, or you may have uh, acute tubular injury, which is where you know, the kidney function is deteriorated more rapidly, but it can recover quite well. And I refer to it as sort of a clean pathologic lesion. That's all you see is that you don't see any other scar anywhere else. You don't see any other um, conditions that have affected the kidney. It's really just that. Um, in the middle, we have this sort of, what we would refer to as a sort of primary FSGS. So you still get a frotic syndrome, but they're not really necessarily crashing. Um, they're not this explosive onset of disease like the first category. And again, they may have variable degrees of renal dysfunction. Sometimes you may find genetic mutation, oftentimes not, as we don't know all the genetic mutations that cause this. <clears throat> um, and then the third category there is we call it secondary FSGS. Um, so thinking that this is really due to some other process that's caused stress on the kidney as a whole, and again, the scar tissue has then developed as opposed to a direct injury to that protocyte cell. Um, so these, you know, these two categories, primary FSGS and middle change, like many of them are immune mediated. And so as a result, um, the big problem is that even if people get a kidney transplant, there's a high risk of relapse because if your immune system still sort of knows how to cause this injury, um, even after a transplant, it may still do that. That's kind of been you know, one way of categorizing it. I actually like this cat way of categorizing it a little bit better. Um, and this was done by um, Andy Bombach out of Columbia um, in, in a review from a year and a half, two years ago. And again, this is where, again, tries to more distinctly separate out these different disease phenotypes or different sort of um, uh, subsets of the protocytopathies as, as a whole. And you can see in the middle is referred to as minimal change FSGS as sort of a, a spectrum or you know, really both together. Um, on the left is this, and the green is really this immune mediated process where you know, typical minimal change disease, a steroid responsive or steroid dependent FSGS, recurrent FSGS, really think this is immune mediated. And we think this is due to some yet defined permeability factor. I mean, it makes the virus uh, much more permeable to protein loss. So whether that's an antibody, whether it's some other protein, that's still again to be determined. And it probably is multiple things in different people. Um, the top you have in the gray, you have um, referred to as sort of a toxic protocytopathy. And so we see this again in where there's more direct injury to the protocyte, not from the immune system, but from either a medication um, or uh, an infection. And uh, there may be some immune response um, that paired with a, a, an underlying genetic predisposition with um, APOL1 <coughs> uh, risk elite over risk variants. <coughs> um, but it's not as uh, sort of clearly immune related as um, the, the category in the green. And because of that, oftentimes not responsive to immunosuppression. Um, we have seen this um, with uh, COVID-19 as well. Um, again, how that exactly happens, we're still trying to uh, better understand that. On the right and the yellow, you have the genetic protocytopathy. So really those are ones that have uh, clearly a variation in a gene that is responsible for making up the protocyte or making up the glomerulonephritis membrane. Some of them are listed there. The last category would is really what I would you know, encourage people to really refer to as quote unquote secondary FSGS is with this adaptive FSGS where again, the kidney has been stressed by something else. Um, I sort of like to convey it as um, the the load on the kidney versus the capacity of the kidney. Um, so the load of the, on the kidney is greater than its capacity. You will get sort of burnout, and then you get this focal segmental sclerosis. Um, and some of the things that can increase load are you know, being very heavy, um, particularly heavy in the central area around the belly. If you have a single kidney, then that kidney is doing all the work, especially from birth. Or even low birth weight um, to you know, sort of begin with is because we see that um, birth weight does correlate with 
how many kidney filters, how many nephrons you have um, uh, to begin with. And, and so you're sort of starting with less capacity, you're dealing with the same load as everyone else, you may burn out um, more quickly. In terms of the pathogenesis of FSGS, it's much more muddy um, in terms of <clears throat> the different um, players. You can see here, this is quite a complicated um, picture. And the honest truth is because we don't know which one of these is the most important in, in each individual. You see uh, everything from the immune system, those T and B cells, um, uh, allergy, uh, the, the um, uh, stem cells that are, um, uh, that are there, uh, Pre-T cells, we see other um, circulating factors such as SUPAR that ultimately will attack the, the really the proteins that are attaching the protocyte to the glomerular base membrane. Really, a host of different possibilities um, that ultimately leads to what we will end up seeing as FSGS. And this, you know, I think this slide really captures how confusing the picture can be and. Unfortunately, um, why we have not been able to make as much progress as we'd like, because um, we've sort of lumped all these conditions in one, you know, one category um, and used the same approach to treating all of them, when clearly you can see from here that that's simply not gonna work. Um, so, you know, initially when I was asked to give this talk, the question you know, that was posed, you know, are FSGS and mental change disease the same thing? Um, and the short answer is no. Um, they're not the same thing. However, there's definitely a, a subset of FSGS that does behave like mineral change. And you could potentially even say they may be the same thing in terms of the underlying disease process. Uh, but in globally speaking, no, they're not. There's overlap, but they're still distinct. Um, really, because you look at those underlying etiologies, the, you know, there's non, the ones that are non immune mediated and don't respond to immunosuppression. You know, those that have recurrence post-transplant may actually be ones that are more behaving like no change. Um, so really we're trying now to say, okay, we know there is this overlap. We know there is this um, shared uh, cause in, in some of these individuals. Um, but so how do we better define that? Um, and so there's been a few tools that have come up and they've become um, potentially helpful. And I'm gonna walk through those over the next few minutes. Now, one is referred to as ultra-structural characteristics. That means I'm going to talk about <clears throat> electron microscopy, so the very, very high level of magnification. Um, and uh, there are some specific characteristics that are seen um, that can potentially help categorize these conditions uh, more um, accurately and more specifically. And then this idea of that immunofluorescence and serology or lab testing where antibodies can actually be detected. So we'll go through both of those next. So this is a, a very, um, very interesting study led out of uh, University of Michigan and the, the Neptune cohort, which many of you may be a part of, um, you know, a collection of many individuals that have um, contributed their time and, and efforts and urine and blood to to this effort of understanding these conditions um, uh, better. And they looked at the Neptune cohort and they looked at <clears throat> really this electron microscopy. They looked at characteristics of FSGS biopsies and mineral change biopsies. And they specifically focused on all these little parts of the biopsy, foot process effacement, condensation of the actin based cytoskeleton, microvillus transfer, all these terms that again, there are really only familiar really to pathologists and some nephrologists. Um, <clears throat> but they looked and saw, okay, when you looked at these all specifically, could you then develop sort of categories? And they did. They actually developed sort of six clusters um, within all those um, biopsies. And you can see there with all those different uh, aspects of the biopsy, looked at, you know, which ones are most dominant. And um, you can see that, um, you know, there was ones that are sort of more clean, where there's really just a few things that are abnormal, and ones that where there's a lot more um, uh, you know, changes that really make it again, more muddy. But with that, after they were to, to cluster in the, the, the kidney biopsies and then the individuals with in these categories, then they looked at how they did. And what you can see is they definitely, people definitely, you know, their outcome 
um, their clinical course, their you know, disease course was very, was different um, in terms of who developed progressive kidney disease or end-stage kidney disease, as well as those that had a uh, remission. Um, and you can see really this, these two clusters, cluster three and cluster four, and that's sort of the black and the yellow, um, had both the lowest risk of developing end-stage kidney disease and the highest likelihood of getting a complete remission. And so those really suggest that those are the ones that perhaps really are really the same, whether they have been diagnosed of mineral change or FSGS, really are the, the least in each of those categories, they are the same um, and very different from the other ones. Um, and very likely an underlying immunologic cause <clears throat> because um, that is, um, uh, they, you know, they do achieve complete remission oftentimes with, with steroid therapy. So we can conclude from this is that there's at least six clinical pathologic entities that make up FSGS and mineral change. Um, one or two entities that are likely overlapping FSGS and mineral change in terms of you know, the clinical changes or the clinical response, and that's at class three and class four. The problem still is that we have no gold standard of how we diagnose these things. Um, it's really, we're defining it by their course and their response to suppression. So we're kind of still moving backwards. Um, we're trying to work backwards, I should say. Um, but it is, again, giving us a little bit more um, understanding. The issue though, is that these are very, very highly qualified, uh, specially trained pathologists that looked at these things in this degree of, um, uh, in this degree of, um, detail. And so in routine clinical practice, this is still not done yet. Um, I think as uh, computer technology and sort of artificial intelligence technology gets better and these things can be defined more quickly, I hope is that this approach does become more widely adopted and so that all of us can see, go, okay, there are, this is the nephronic syndrome class three. Um, and ultimately, Hopefully that will guide um, our therapeutic approach in a more rational way. Another a very exciting tool um, was uh, presented at the ASN, I believe it was last year, and really a discovery of an autoantibody involved in mineral change. So autoantibody is really the, again, the part of the immune system. Um, we think that these are immune mediated or autoimmune. So there's an antibody that the body is generating against some you know, part of the kidney oftentimes that then is the attack of the kidney and leads to then the inflammation um, that leads to the injury to the kidney cells. And once again, looked at the Neptune core and the, the individuals with minimal change compared to healthy people and people with <clears throat> a different nephronic syndrome, membranous nephropathy. And they look for a specific antibody called antinephrine. And IgG is the sort of the type of antibody we see and they used antinephrine, clearly that was a, that was a responsible, um, you know, responsible target. Um, and we know that in, you know, nephrine is a key protein in uh, protocyte integrity and mutations or genetic variations in nephrine can lead to a, a genetic form of nephronic syndrome. What they saw is that, you know, almost a third of the patients who had a clinically active disease, a nephronic range proteinuria, um, had autoantibodies to nephrine and it didn't cross-react to any other autoantibodies. And those antibodies did correspond to the treatment response. And there's also a pathologic correlation that they found. So this was you know, looking at the antibody levels. Um, the top is sort of the, the amount of anti-nephrine antibody and the, again, the minimal change cohort, you can see there's much higher levels compared to healthy cohort or those with nephrotic syndrome from membranous nephropathy. It was a different uh, process. And you could see that the antibody levels were significantly lower um, in individuals when they were in remission. Uh, so the blue, the blue um, uh, circles on the, the second ch chart, as opposed to when they're active. So again, suggesting that all right, if they're high when your disease is active and they're low when they're in remission, that's very likely the responsible you know, process. <clears throat> you now, I said before that mineral changes conventionally been thought to be a negative immunofluorescence uh, uh, on kidney biopsy. Um, but oftentimes we've seen sort of this very light staining. 
um, that has kind of been overlooked, say it's probably just artifact, meaning that when you preserve it, you know, make the tissue just sort of pops up without really being significant. But then they actually were able to say, well, maybe these are actually significant. And let's see where those antibodies are actually ending up in the kidney. And it turned out those antibodies were actually going to the nephrine, going to the nephrine uh, protein in, um, in the kidney tissue. And so um, the same individuals that had those high antibody levels had more of these antibodies, these IgG deposits um, at, you know, at nephrine. Um, and once again, those levels correlated with um, treatment response. And lastly, to try to again, really say, is this really causative? Um, they saw that antibody levels uh, corresponded with a post-transplant relapse. Um, and you can see that um, <clears throat> they're actually able to take blood and, and, um, and look at the antibody levels before transplant. Um, and after transplant, when they sort of increased, that was when, again, nephronic syndrome uh, recurred. So once again, <clears throat> um, you know, really kind of trying to make the case to put these things together, saying these autoantibodies are not only there, uh, we're not only finding them in, in individuals with mineral change, but we are um, uh, really they're really corresponding with disease activity, so they're very likely you know, causative. So, you know, this has just all been discovered. Um, uh, very clearly a brilliant scientist, um, uh, Dr. Astrid Wenz, um, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, but she was out of the, the Harvard Medical uh, School and the uh, Brigham and Women's Hospital. She has done most of this work, and I mean, really has led this work, and um, it's very exciting. Um, you know, we're quite excited about this because again, really trying to identify this culprit does kind of make this whole story come together a little bit more. It does implicate B cells, the antibody producing cells is involved in the, in the pathogenesis of mineral change. And it makes sense now why things like rituximab actually work um, because they're knocking out B cells, which are preventing antibodies from being produced, which ultimately prevents, you know, or you know, allows the condition to, to, to uh, remit. Um, and, you know, the real um, great, great thing would be, okay, if we could have this as a test widely available, um, uh, you know, could we use it to kind of follow treatment response? Um, and would that lead to shorter steroid courses, which we'd all love, or earlier use of steroid alternatives? Um, because we know that the antibody is there, and we can really treat that um, accordingly. The, the next thing that um, Dr. Wen is, lo is looking at is actually the, um, the cohort of FSGS patients in the Neptune. Um, uh, in the Neptune study, and seeing, you know, do they have, do any of them have anti-nephrine antibodies? And particularly, does the, the steroid responsive cohort have that? Or the individuals that have post-transplant recurrence? Um, and, you know, our bet is that is some, if not all of them, are going to have this anti-nephrine antibody, which we want to get, once again, kind of highlight this overlap between mineral change in FSGS and a subset of FSGS. I suspect I'd be quite surprised if all the FSGS patients had the Santinepher in her body, and that would kind of cloud the picture a bit. Um, but I am, again, very excited to see what comes out next to this. So in terms, uh, we'll move on to, you know, how we manage this or try, or try to manage this in therapeutic interventions existing and down the road. Some general principles <clears throat> that we use for treatment of chronic syndrome, we're going to reduce protein in the urine because that ultimately we know leads to many of the complications of the chronic syndrome. So use what we refer to as RAS blockade. Those are ACE inhibitors and angiotensin receptor blockers. We control blood pressure to, to kind of lower the filtered pressure on the kidney. And then again, if there's specifics about each condition, we use them to suppression. Um, we also want to make sure we manage the complications. As I mentioned, people get high cholesterol, we can manage that. Fluid retention, you manage that with diuretics. Some people have a tendency to form blood clots. Um, this is less of mineral change in FSGS, but more in... Um, <clears throat> excuse me, in um, member sephropathy. Uh, we know that in addition to losing protein like albumin and vitamin D binding protein, people are losing antibodies as well. And so, you know, giving um, appropriate vaccination to try to prevent um, people from getting infections on top of what they already have is, is really important. Um, it's inactivated there because my vaccines, especially if you were on immunosuppression are quite dangerous. Um, uh, so, 
early inactivated vaccines, um, and then appropriate nutritional support because you're all losing lots of protein. So the, some of the principles of protein restriction and people kidney disease do not, uh, you know, do not hold here. Um, in terms of the sort of approach treatment, I'm going to really kind of highlight um, you know, the KDGO guidelines. So KDGO is our kidney disease improving global outcomes. So it's really a, a consensus um, of you know, the experts in the field, um, people smarter than I am and have done more than I have um, in, this, in this area, uh, came together over 2020 and 2021 and, and developed the updated guidelines. It had been quite a few years since the last one. Um, uh, so we were looking forward to these. Um, and there were some important you know, changes for sure, uh, but I think we have even more on the horizon. The middle change is still considered a steroid response to disease and the initial response to steroid guides future therapy options. Um, there's some data on alternative therapies as first line. Um, you can see here, if someone has no contraindication to steroids, that's really the, the first line. If they have an absolute contraindication, you can use an alternative condition, uh, uh, alternative agent. Calcineur inhibitors have the uh, so tacrolimus and cyclosporin have the most <clears throat> um, data for as a steroid alternative. For Tuxom, you see there's a question mark. Um, it has been looked at as a first line agent. There's actually a clinical trial going on right now to look at rituximab as the initial um, therapy. Um, and we are all um, curious on how this will turn out. Um, there are some concerns about using it um, in, immediately when people have heavy protein loss, um, uh, including, you know, are you losing some of the rituximab drug in, into the urine? Um, but again, that still needs to be defined and we'll see what this trial certainly shows. Um, if people have <clears throat> steroid dependence or they're relapsing, um, then, you know, cyclophosphamide is the, the drug that has been used the most and that has the most experience. And so we do use that oftentimes as the, the next step. I will say that this is the KDGO guidelines, but um, you know, given our most of our clinical experience with, with rituximab, um, oftentimes we will move to that um, uh, first. Uh, it, it does have a high success rate in the reported and published data, but there's really no, been no controlled trials um, outside of one ongoing. And it's still off-label, actually all these things are still off-label outside of steroids. <clears throat> and so um, sometimes there can be some roadblocks in terms of getting insurance authorization, but that seems to be less of an issue now than it was five years ago. Um, in terms of um, FSGS, um, in terms of the approach to treatment, uh, the first step, of course, is, or, you know, really should say is try to classify the FSGS more distinctly. Um, specifically, can we say this is which of those four categories permeability factor mediated, genetic, adaptive, toxic mediated, which of those is really the, um, the thought to be at, you know, playing a role in, in each individual. For the individuals that you really think that they have this permeability mediated or immune mediated, then, you know, then steroids are still the first uh, line data. So you can see here, so if you have FSGS, and nephrotic syndrome, so the whole thing, not just the heavy protein loss. Um, you have diffuse foot process effacement, so that kidney biopsy, we talked about that foot process all look flattened out like that. We, at this point in time, we still, that's the best tools we have to say, okay, yeah, this is at least has a high likelihood of being an immune mediated uh, process. And so um, it's, it's a trial of steroids is, worthwhile, um, or a trial of immunosuppression at least, is worthwhile if there's contraindication to steroids. Um, we're much more cautious about this than I think we were because we realized, I mean, you know, you guys I don't need to uh, tell anybody in this audience that steroids have terrible um, side effects and we really are trying to use those less and less, but it's still oftentimes our first, the first thing we reach for. If there is really you know, enough to sway someone and say, I don't think this is immune mediated, this is not like the quote unquote permanent value factor mediated, then it's important to not expose people to immunosuppression. Um, don't give them steroids, don't give them cyclophosphamide, don't give them rituximab. Um, it is, genetic testing can be very helpful in this, in this uh, category to, again, really identify if you have a genetic variation that's causing your protein loss, because that would once again, 
steer people away from giving um, you know, immunosuppression and steroids in particular. Um, you try to maximize for just non-specific antiproteinuric therapy, ACE and the angiotensin receptor blockers, sodium, the new agents, um, sodium glucose transport inhibitors, um, and you know another novel agent that's being looked at, mineral receptor antagonist um, like spironolactone. But really, those individuals that um, you know, as I tell clinicians, to so really consider those individuals to refer for a clinical trial, um, because we can truly believe that the best thing we can offer them. Um, is you know discovering something better for them um, and exposing them to medications just for the sake of just trying stuff is not you know not the best way to go. Um, you know the conventional teaching has been 16 weeks of high dose steroids um, and prednisone one milligram per kilogram per day equivalent and I see my response to that that dosing ugh, I mean hate it. Hate it, hate it, hate it. I mean, and only a fraction, I'm sure, of how much um, people have had to take it, um, hate it. Um, and so, you know, we really try to see, okay, are there ways to reduce this or, or you know, modify this? And there was a re more recent study um, uh, just a few months ago that was published just a few months ago, looked at 70 FSGS patients that were considered really have this sort of permeability factor mediated FSGS and they're treated with high dose steroids. And they narrowed the cohort of 51 patients that remained on 16 weeks of therapy. And what they really saw is that if you had at least at eight weeks, if you had 20% or more reduction in protein years, so not the whole remission, um, but at least you, you were seeing a big, a significant change. They were very likely to then ultimately respond um, and again, speaks to this being a, a an immune mediated process. It's just that, of course, they were they were kept on steroids for that whole time. And the way I've looked at this data and said, okay, well, that's interesting. So those people that are having some response, we think it's immune mediated. Can we then switch to an alter, steroid alternative um, at that point um, in, in a safe way, sort of a cross tapering way, um, so to try to minimize the total amount of steroids that. They, someone gets. If you have less than 20% of response eight weeks, you're highly unlikely to have any response. And the best thing is to you know, taper off steroids quickly at that point. So really trying to um, see if we can lower the, the cumulative amount, but still far from where we should be. Um, so this is sort of a modified approach. FSGS, we think this is permeability factor mediated. Um, you know, all the things we talked about, nephrotic syndrome, foot process effacement, starting to suppression uh, at, at eight weeks, if you have, you know, 20% or greater than 20% reduction in protein in the urine, continue therapy. And that was in the, you know, the recommendations from the editorial were saying you can use steroids. Um, uh, if there's less than 20% reduction, to try really a different age. Um, definitely not doing steroids. Maybe calcium inhibitors, but you have to really then think, okay, is this non-immune mediated? Um, and early adoption, genetic testing at that time, and we're looking at, again, clinical trial um, referral. So what's on the horizon? The last few minutes, we'll just talk about a few things that are looking at on the horizon. Um, look at um, you know, the minimal, minimal change active clinical trials. I mentioned rituximab as first line therapy is an ongoing study. The study of a, <clears throat> a monoclonal antibody called adalimumab, um, which is against a different um, uh, part of the immune system called TNF-alpha, um, which also may be playing a role in this immune injury. And then lastly, there is a, um, an ongoing study um, of looking at uh, blocking something called TRIPSI-5, which is a, a channel um, uh, in the podocyte that ultimately, when it's open uh, um, or overactive, it sort of allows for this cascade of injury to the um, podocyte to occur. Um, and this is sort of a depiction of that. <clears throat> um, uh, of the, the, the study agent being used as a trypc 5 inhibitor, because what you see here is that once trypc 5 is activated, there's an influx of calcium into the cell, something called calcineurin becomes more active, there's, um, this degrades or dephosphorylates synaptopodin, uh, which is an important protein in, in allowing sort of the hold of the podocyte to the, the basal membrane, um, as well as inflammatory, um, in, increasing inflammation. So if you can block that pathway to begin with, 
and may prevent that whole cascade. And so that's that's being looked at right now. Um, in terms of FSGS, you can see here a flurry of clinical trials, which is very exciting. And the most there have been really ever, um, and I won't go into all, detail for all of those, but uh, it's a great opportunity, but it's also in some ways, um, it's gonna be a little bit careful because we've talked just the last, you know, many minutes about how these are different conditions. And so if we, you know, refer all them to, you know, these trials um, where they all are sort of targeting a different pathway, we know that there's gonna be a lot of things that end up not showing an impact. And so the, you know, that's, that's how we've gotten into this trouble. That's how we've gotten where we are now. Um, so I do think careful selection of which trial for which person is really important. Um, as much as you can. Um, it's obviously a discussion with the, you know, the person who's going through it, most importantly. And you know, I could bring this up again because it's a much more complicated disease state. So that's why there's really a potential, you know, many potential targets, but which one and which person is really still um, uh, what we need to know. So, um, you know, the success of B-cell depleting therapy like rituximab has, um, as well as, you know, difficulty in sort of control groups, so people that are not on steroids, in some ways it's kind of limited investment in clinical trials and mineral change. You know, we use rituximab off-label, and so there's, again, you really have to have, um, we refer to as equipoise, that being in a clinical trial, um, being in a control arm, so the standard of care alone is, is acceptable for a person. And if I see that you know they're clearly steroid responsive, or they're clearly rituximab responsive, or they're very likely to be rituximab responsive, I'm not going to ethically, um, you know, this is, uh, I have the uh, I do not have the ethical sort of backing, I'd say, to to refer them for a clinical trial where they may not receive an active drug. Um, but with FSGS, you know, lots of investment, which is great. Um, uh, it'd be great to know a lot of these questions, you know, they answer a lot of these questions, how do we select patients for prolosophic trial? And, you know, once these agents, you know, if they are successful, they're approved, will they be used together separately? And if they're together, you know, how, what's going to be the burden of, um, you know, cost of these, of these, uh, each agent, um, and how will we support people that need it? So I will, um, Finish off with this last few thoughts. Um, in their current definitions of FSGS, we will change these. They're pathologic description of disease entities without really a precise understanding of the pathogenesis. Mineral change disease and a subset of FSGS cases are likely to go on the same disease. Um, uh, is that you know anti nephrin antibody glomerulonephritis? Um, is that uh, supar mediated uh, podocytopathy? That's still um, not quite clear. Uh, we're hoping that these novel diagnostic tools that we walk through a lot better to find the subset of each disease. We've made some progress, um, but we're limited by ongoing reliance on steroid as a standard of care and again the flawed disease definitions. Um, but really, you know, we are excited as a nephrologist who takes care of patients with nephrotic syndrome, how much investment there's been, how much commitment there's been from small and big companies to develop um, therapeutic interventions and you know, the reason we do this is that we hope that we'll have better things um, and that uh, we'll have safe, effective interventions for people, um, you know, in certainly in my career and lifetime. So I will stop there and um, please uh, take any questions. I think, I don't think we can hear you, Blair. I think we're, I think you're muted. Can you hear me now? There we go. Um, the Q&A box is open for the participants. So if anybody has any questions, feel free to, to type them in there and we can pass them along. Um, I'll, I'll start off with sure. a question just to open up. Um, sure. For when you, could you, could you walk through maybe if some of our, our patients nephrologists maybe aren't familiar with clinical trials or to how enroll folks in a clinical trial, what's, what's the best way for the patient or the patient parent to approach the nephrologist about participating or learning more about a clinical trial? Yeah, I think that ultimately um, the patient's voice is, is immensely helpful moving this forward. So there's um, a lot of different tools. Um, the Kidney Health Gateway that NEFCURE has actually developed is a great tool that really helps you, um, 
it's for both clinicians as well as patients that say, okay, uh, and I'm sure you have a link um, that you can uh, provide. Um, you look up, you, you know, go to the kidney health gateway, you say, okay, this is my disease state. I have nephrotic syndrome, I have FSGS, mental change. This is where I live. Um, this is my age, some other um, factors. And enter it in, and this ends up um, giving you a list of clinical trials that are perhaps appropriate for you um, uh, or you know, wherever you're looking for and, and ge geographically which is closest to you. And, um, you know, and once you have that, then I would, you know, I really would um, leave it up to the individual in terms of how sort of they feel comfortable being in their relationship with the nephrologist because if things are working, things are working. That's great. But if things are not, um, or there's an interest in being part of something that really is going to help you know, thousands of people like uh, the person going through it, um, then you have, there's nothing, you should, never, you should never be feel like you're, you are um, restricted in terms of, you know, pick up the phone, emailing, because all that contact information for the trial will be on, the, on that um, link. And, and say, you know what, found this trial, you know, can I learn more about it? Can I be a part of it? Um, and so we've had people come to us that way. We've also had people go to the nephrologist and say, you know, do you, is, are things working? Are things working? And is this, you know, I saw this and is this um, something that I should, um, you know, I should explore it. And unless things are perfect, um, you know, really are you know, uh, going well, then I would hope that, and I know it's not true always, um, that a nephrologist would say, yes, you know, we should, we, I, what I'm offering you now is sort of the limit of what we have available. And so if that's the case, you know, what you um, being a part of a trial may be um, of interest and may be helpful. But, you know, I want to say something very transparently is that, you know, being in a clinical trial, um, I, you know, I tell people this when they come for a trial, is that you really, yes, you may get something out of it, um, but more, you know, 100% other people like you are getting, are going to um, uh, benefit from. It. What I mean by that is that, you know, most trials, the way we conduct trials, at least most of them are, um, in later phases, are controlled trials, meaning that there's randomization. So half of the group gets the standard of care right now. So that could be ACE inhibitors and blood pressure control and all the things that we know right now. And the other half gets that plus the experimental agent. And so there is a 50-50% you know, chance that you go in and you're getting the same therapy you were already getting. Um, and, you know, I, 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 say, I say this explicitly because um, we want to make sure that people understand that. We would not get anywhere without people saying, that's okay, I understand that, but I want to step forward anyways. And we are, as a trialist, as a nephrologist, uh, we are immensely grateful for people that will do that because it's such a selfless act. Um, you may get something out of it. You may get the active medication that may help. Um, but really, you may get the standard of care alone, which does mean you're going to get, you know, you get a lot of attention. <laughs> you know, so if you'll, you know, we're in your clinical trial, you're going to, uh, you're going to be seeing, you know, the investigator and the, the coordinator quite a bit um, with a lot of tests to make sure everything is going, safety being the most important thing, and you know that you're doing as well as we can. Um, but otherwise, you know, you may not get something quote unquote new. Um, some trials have what they call an open label extension. So after the randomization period, there's an open label part where everyone gets the active drug. Usually that's after there's been some data that's positive to say, okay, yes, we think this is really working. So let's um, add a, an open label extension. But at least when trials are oftentimes designed up front, they're purely randomized, um, especially when you're talking about the last step before drug approval, so phase three trials. So, Long answer to a short question, you know, Kidney Health Gateway um, is a great tool to start with. Certainly, you can ask your nephrologist if you, um, you can start with there. But the Kidney Health Gateway will give you that information, give you the links to where you can go. And then, you know, as an individual who's caring for someone with this or, or uh, dealing with this yourself, you have every, every right and, um, uh, to say, you know, let me at least learn more about this. And, um, uh, and if you know, it's not right for you, then obviously it's not right for you then, but uh, at least you know what's out there. We've had a couple questions come in. 
Um, Don yeah. asked, Don asked, do you think that minimal change disease can progress to FSGS as relapses over time cause damage to the kidneys? That's a great question. So this is also part of where kind of the overlap lies in. So I was saying, so FSGS is really a description of what, um, what we see on light microscopy. So with, when people have had recurrent um, or sort of recurrent relapses or multiple relapses and there's injury to the podocyte again and again, there may be some incomplete healing and that may manifest as a scar. Um, so that is then, you know, we'll look at uh, kidney biopsy look like FSGS. The, the, but the key thing is, is to understand that the condition didn't change. It, it progressed, but it didn't change. It wasn't that you had a mental change and, and now you have FSGS as a, as a different disease entity. It's just that you have a podocytopathy to begin with, and after recurrent injuries, um, some scar had, can develop, and that has led to this um, this now picture and description, um, what will refer, be referred to as FSGS. Denise asks, what other trials are available for steroid responsive adult uh, minimal change disease patients? Yeah, so actually there are not a lot, um, but I will the 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 one I mentioned the uh, um, TRIPSI five um, inhibitor. Uh, you it um, it is sort of designed to be for people who have resistant disease or you know sort of intolerance. So they've been on steroids for so many times um, that you know it's no longer really a, a good option, and so. Even though you're maybe steroid responsive, exposure to more steroids is not um, is not uh, a good idea. Um, and so that study, um, uh, it's GFB eight eight seven two zero one is the you know the, the name of the study um, uh, or the traction study um, is a uh, an active study for um, individuals with minimal change uh, that have had you know, had steroid responsive but sort of become intolerant. Um, beyond that, um, there is, for minimal chains specifically, they're steroid responsive. There has not been, um, uh, there's the adalubumab, the TNF-alpha blocker um, study, um, uh, but really not uh, anything more than that that I'm aware of um, right now. Tracy is asking, how invasive is it to see if your child has the nephrine antibodies that may cause MCD? Is it a simple mm -hmm. blood test or biopsy? And also, have you heard of the Tango study? Uh, yeah, so in terms of um, the antinephrine antibodies, it's so not commercially available as of yet, um, but it is a, um, it is it meant to be just a blood test. Um, and uh, to look for the antibody present. Um, so similar to how we do in um, other immune mediated conditions like lupus or vasculitis or membrane propathy, um, we look at um, uh, it's simply a blood test. Um, the biopsy can be looked at as well, but um, depending on you know, how long ago the biopsy was, um, they may be able to use the, you know, the same uh, tissue um, and to, to look at it there. Um, to answer your second question, I have heard of the Tango study, but I am, it's escaping me now the, the details of it. Um, and so was there a specific uh, uh, question about it? And so I can refresh myself on what it is. I don't think there was any uh, follow-up to that. We can go to the next question and come back um, if... Yeah. Tracy wants to, to ask a deeper question about Tango. Shannon asks, um, she says, my daughter's biopsy showed IgM nephropathy with mesangial hypercellularity and some thin basement membrane disease. Her diagnosis has been all over. We have already done one genetics test that came back non-conclusive. I'm waiting on results from the second test. The geneticist has says we will likely receive no results from this test either. She is steroid dependent. Would it be right, wise to recommend a second biopsy or clinical trial to her nephrologist? Yeah, it's a good question. So, um, so IgM is an interesting, um, so IgM, you know, there's different classes of, of antibodies, IgG, IgA, um, IgM, IgE. 
And IGM is the biggest one of these, the biggest structure. And so um, when we see IGM in a kidney biopsy, and that's an IGM alone, we wonder whether it's truly the IGM is actually causing uh, the problem or it's the, the kidneys sort of, the injured kidneys are acting like a, like a sink and the IgM gets stuck in there. Um, so whether you know, IgM nephropathy was defined that may define that way means that the IgM is really pathogenic is not clear. And I would favor that it's not pathogenic. It's more that we will see it there. Um, in terms of the, um, so then, you know, I think, you, you know, there's a, there's a clearly a, a nephrotic syndrome there um, that is steroid dependent and steroid responsive. So it suggests there's an immune mediated process that's going on. Um, and in that case, I don't think genetic testing will be of much yield because you sort of seen that it does respond to the suppression. There's gonna be some, there is some overlap. I uh, shouldn't say they're completely distinct and, and not seeing kids. Um, I think there's more nuance to this than I even I uh, can, um, can espouse on. But um, point being is that uh, I don't think that the, the genetic testing is gonna give you sort of the answer of, kind of why this happened. Uh, another biopsy I don't think is gonna be helpful. I mean, you kind of know what's there um, and it's still, we're still, we're still stuck in the same issue of you know, disease definition um, and this could be descriptive. And so while they may say there's FSGS now, the disease didn't change. It's, it's just that if there's more scar there, we'll see FSGS. So in terms of um, uh, you know, the utility of repeat biopsy, no. In terms of clinical trials, um, the short answer is yes, it would be good. This is a, you know, a sub, you know, you know, ultra rare subset of an ultra rare disease. And so whether there's a um, specific clinical trial going on for um, you know, that subset, uh, I'm not aware of one. Um, but again, I'm not a pediatric nephrologist, so that's the, um, that's the caveat I will. Uh, I will. Um, that being said, there may be a role for steroid alternatives if, if, they, if the condition has been steroid responsive. Um, and um, that's where, at least in the, while there may not be large um, clinical trials as we sort of define them specifically, there may be individuals that are using a more um, nuanced protocol of how to, how to, how to treat these. And, and that's where, um, you know, pediatric glomerular disease centers of excellence uh, are really the, the way to go because if, if maybe they're already, um, because they're gonna have you know, a much more breadth of experience with this and will have a more sort of established protocol and say, okay, what can we use in, as a steroid alternative? <clears throat> so we have two questions to wrap up. Aaron asks, um, is it beneficial to have a renal biopsy done every few years to determine the progression of FSGS or are labs such as blood and urine adequate enough to determine progression of the disease? Um, it's a good question. So um, in short, uh, we don't routinely biopsy people um, again and again um, for the, because of the you know, potential risk. Um, lab tests are, are very good, um, creatinine, proteinuria, et cetera, but they are not, you know, they, they can definitely, um, the problem is that the kidney can compensate for a while. And so you, your kidney function may look quote unquote better than it actually is, or the, than the extent of damage is, um, uh, you know, that a kidney biopsy would show. So in that respects, it will better, more accurately define disease progression, but it's not something that I would recommend doing because, you know, while biopsies are mostly safe, um, there is definitely a risk. And if it's going to truly change your approach to treatment in terms of your on current medication and you want to say, can I stop this or should I change this? Then I would say, yes, like repeat biopsies um, are you know, very helpful. Um, but in the absence of that, um, I would not, you know, it's certainly not routinely um, for FSGS patients. And our last question comes from Wei. Sometimes children outgrow nephrotic syndrome. Would you advise at what age range they typically outgrow the disease? 
Yeah, um, it's a good question. I, I think that we definitely see this and not being a pediatric nephrologist, I see sort of the, end, the other end of it um, when they're in their adult range. So um, I know kind of in that late adolescence, early adulthood is kind of when we see people that will have had nephrotic syndrome and says, quote unquote, I've grown it. Um, but I, unfortunately, um, as a adult nephrologist, I can't give you um, a more specific age range where we see the most common kind of uh, time we do outgrow it.